Hi, I'm Rebecca Zung, top 1% divorce attorney and the best-selling author of the books, Negotiate Like You Matter, and Breaking Free, a step-by-step -step divorce guide. And I've helped thousands of people go from lives of drama, trauma, and chaos to step into lives of freedom, possibility, and purpose. And I do the same thing right here with you guys in these videos. So before we go any further, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, go on, do it right now. And then we're going to dive into part two of my conversation with Tina Swithin, who founded One Mom's Battle, and Dr. Romney, famous li licensed clinical psychologist and expert on narcissism. So without further ado, let's dive into part two. So Dr. Romney, how about, um, let's um, bring you in on this and what's going on psychologically with a narcissist during a divorce. I mean, listen, it, it comes down to a narcissist is actually the most extraordinarily easy human being to understand. It, it's interesting to me how everyone's befuddled by them. They're actually more easy to understand than me, you know, because I'm actually motivated by lots of complicated things. So understanding so someone who's healthy is challenging. Understanding, something, understanding someone who's narcissistic is actually like trying to understand a rat in the maze. You know, as long as you can, and you called it leverage. I think it goes beyond that, though. I mean, at the end of the day, the narcissist is motivated by protecting their own insecurity. That's what it is for them. They feel chronically, strangely, we feel unsafe with them. Well, that's a projection. They chronically feel threatened by the world. They chronically feel unsafe. So all of these defenses, the arrogance, the entitlement, the grandiosity, all of it is designed to protect their fragile egos. And in that quest, the best tool for that is narcissistic supply. Narcissistic supply comes from two paths. Path number one is the, trad the traditional validation. Tell me I'm great. Tell me I'm wonderful. Tell me what a great guy I am. Tell me how successful I am. Look at my big house. Look at my big car. Look at my big this. Look at my big that. That's, the, that's, that's path one. But we forget that the second path of narcissistic supply is conflict. They really, really enjoy their ability to intimidate, oppress, and bully other people. What does it do? It gives them, just like the playground bully, a false sense of strength that protects that insecurity. So it really is very easy to understand them. I think what throws people off is that they think narcissistic supply is only the good stuff, the really big ticket validating stuff like you're so great, look at my big car. The other side of it though, that they're actually, they are in kind of enjoy conflict. It's always about the win for them, but ultimately the win is one more source of supply. So it's really the clearest lens to view all of this through. And when we realize narcissistic supply is actually a complex space, that also makes this a bit easier, as it were, to understand. And I think the challenge is, even as I hear Tina's story, you and I have talked about cases on both of our ends, is that obviously once you're in it and there's high stakes, there's children, there's material issues like, you know, supports and financial issues and all of that, it starts getting challenging, especially if you're beholden to them. And anyone who's in a joint custody situation is beholden to them because they want to keep their children safe. And so, but that's really what the motivator is. I mean, it really is. They, they care very much about the, what the world thinks of them. You know, again, why? Because they're insecure. Secure people, I don't care what anyone thinks of me. I mean, I don't think I've changed my sweatpants in three days. Like, I don't care. Now everybody knows, you know, it's, it's the not caring. And they care, they care so desperately. So even while they're, they're contemptuous of other people, contemptuous of their relationships, honestly, they're contemptuous of them because it's a defense, because they need their approval so much. So actually very easy to understand, rats in a maze. That's it, rats in a maze. Yeah, but then the way it manifests itself is just heinous and especially- It's absolutely heinous. As all insecure people, the most insecure people in our midst are often the most dangerous because yeah. they're going to do anything to protect their insecurity. So it is heinous, absolutely. Yeah, and especially in a divorce because they just have this incredible need for self-preservation and they're, it's like they're the fight of their life. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're in this massive- uh, survival mode, but then, mm -hmm. you know, their target is also in survival mode because, you know, they know they're being, they're under attack, they're under siege and, and, and they're under siege in a way from this person. Mm -hmm. uh, what, and, and this is what I always say the divorce paradox is, which is during the worst, most horrible and, and traumatic time of your life. I mean, if you look at any 
um, polls on what's the most traumatic thing that humans can deal with, it's always death and divorce or at the top. And mm -hmm. I think prison is in there somewhere, but it, prison's actually lower than divorce. Like people would mm -hmm. rather be in prison than get a divorce. Um, but you know, during the worst, most traumatic time of your life, you have to make the most critical decisions of your life. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're under siege and it's, ba it's bad enough when you're divorcing normally, but then when you're, you add on the layer of divorcing a narcissist, now you're, you're, you're trying to make decisions about your money, your home, your children, all the things that mean the most to you, your business, you know, potentially. Um, while you're under siege and while you're trying to heal yourself. I mean, you know, people who've been in um, narcissistic person, uh, narcissistic relationships for long periods of time are like PTSD. I mean, they're, they're seriously, you know, traumatized and, and you're, they're trying to make decisions. So, you know, for example, this woman I spoke to this morning, she wants to change her custody arrangement. Um, she said that, you know, when she entered into the custody agreement at the time, she just, she was so terrorized by him. She just wanted to get out of it. She just wanted to be done. Uh, and so she agreed to stuff that she didn't want, that she didn't, now she regrets, you know? So what I'd like to hear from Tina is, um, how did you keep your mindset strong? How were you able to keep going and keep, and not give up and keep yourself healthy? You know, it, it was a process, you know, the first few years, had I not been journaling and blogging about it, if I were to look back, I don't, I remember very little of it. I feel like I was operating in a, in a state of trauma and shock and emotions. Um, and for me, it was a few years into it before I started going to sit in the courtroom and it was a way for me to learn about the process and you know, how attorneys handle things and how, you know, different case law. And I became a fixture in the courtroom on days that it had nothing to do with me. And just there as an observer, because it allowed, you know, first for me to desensitize myself, um, because it just became part of my every, you know, so then walking into the courtroom when it was my own case, I was much stronger. Um, and I was educated on what was going on and, and the motions that I was filing. Um, and, and I didn't get it right all the time, but it, it helped tremendously. And what I learned is that so much of it is about strategy and you, you know, judges and yeah. attorneys, anybody in those courtrooms, they don't want to see your emotions. You know, that was one of the things I learned quickly is I would walk to the bathroom in the courthouse and have a panic attack or vomit or break down crying. But when I walked through those doors, I had to, you know, put my shoulders back and my head up and, you know, almost role play was um, kind of the mentality I had to have. But, you know, and just forming alliances when I would be in the courtroom and I would see another parent who I could you know, identify as the healthy parent in the situation, I'd follow them out into the hallway and say, here's my card. I'd love, sounds crazy. I'd love to go to coffee with you because we have a lot in common. And that started building my local team. Um, so, you know, those were some of the things that, that I did in the beginning. And from day one, I remember people telling me, you, you know, this is a 50-50 state. California, I think every state is 50-50 at this point. And that's, you know, truly what you just have to accept that. And I refused. I couldn't even, you know, grasp how somebody could, you know, some people, it's truly, you know, their exes are so good at impression management that that may be in the cards for them. And, and then you, you know, you're forced to accept radical acceptance, you know, managing your expectations, that whole, whole thing. But for me, I just, I couldn't accept that that was what was best for my kids. And that was the mentality I kept moving me forward and, and really celebrating the little victories, which I consider to be anytime my kids are a little bit safer. Um, and, and that just kept the momentum going until I think it was about year six that we were assigned a custody evaluator and he really understood what I was up against. And his, um, his orders or his recommendation to the court 
were unlike anything I have ever heard of before. And it was so strict. And the judge ended up saying, I'm not going to adopt all of these because I don't want to micromanage this guy. But the ultimate ruling um, on year six was permanent supervised visits. So he could never again be alone. And the judge said, I intend for these to be final custody orders, which was huge. Um, but as we know, a narcissist can't handle that. Their ego doesn't want someone <laughs> supervising them. That's a huge threat. And so he jumped ship and we didn't hear from him for a year and a half. Um, but that was a year and a half of peace. And I, you know, I yeah, was fantastic. So it's those baby steps. It's, you know what, today my kids are a little bit safer. And, and that kept me going. And when I did, you know, there were so many times where I threw myself a huge pity party when I got slammed in court or, and, and I just always set an end time. You know, I, I can allow myself a day or two to be mad or angry because it's warranted. But then, you know, Friday, I'm going to dust myself off and I'm going to try again because my kids need me. There's no one else that's going to fight for them. Absolutely. I just want to inject a little bit of the legal side of what you, some of the things that you just said. Um, and one is that, yeah, there is a kind of unspoken presumption, I'll call it, for this 50-50 thing right now in most of the states. Um, I think there are a couple of holdouts. I think New York doesn't quite have that presumption yet. But um, it's, it's not necessarily a legal presumption, meaning um, a legal presumption would mean that when the court sits down, when the judge sits down, then they're going to presume that this is what it's going to be. And then the other person who doesn't want that has the burden of proving why it shouldn't be that. So that would be a legal presumption. So it's not necessarily a legal presumption in a lot of the states, but it's kind of like an unspoken presumption. Um, and so what I want people to remember is that what the real presumption is and should always be is best interest of the child. And I just had a situation with this with the judge back in January. I was at a hearing um, and um, the judge, the, the baby at the time was maybe five months old or something like that. And the judge was like, well, you know, you guys are coming to trial in May. Um, so, uh, you know, don't bother coming in here. Um, if, you know, you know that it's going to be 50, 50 and, and, and whatever. And I'm like, really, your honor, before you even hear one word about what's in the best interest of this child, um, you know, that there's 18 factors in the statute that you're supposed to consider. So if you're making a, a, a decision right here and now, then that's grounds for your rec recusal. And um, so, you know, right away, he's like, oh, of course, of course, we have to, you know, c c consider the, the factors and, you know, um, and of course, he backpedaled right away. But, um, you know, I want people to understand that, yes, it's that, but don't just give up on that. Don't just say that's what it's, it, it is and be resigned to that. Remind the court, remind the judge, remind everybody you can that the, the standard is best interest of the child. And there is, I'm, I'm sure, a statute in every single state that has, you know, the factors that have to be considered by the court. So don't just like resign yourself to that's what it's going to be. So. So um, Rebecca, I have a, a comment on that though, because despite that, the best interest of the child, you know, anyone who's, you know, doing advocacy work, mental health work, you've been in the divorce space, in all of the, almost all of these cases, I'm, I'm not willing to hazard a guess that 75 to 90% of these cases, they're not taking into account the best interest of the no, child. And these statutes and these 18 points and all this stuff can exist. And in that particular case, it might have even been easier because it was a five month old baby. But what I am seeing over and over and over again is cases where there is no way on planet earth that the best interest of this child is being accounted for. So even if that's written into the law, and I suppose, yes, it becomes one more grounds of which an attorney could attempt to push the point, I still feel like most judges are going to reject that out of hand because they still feel like the argument of a parent that's antagonistic and toxic and undermining and invalidating and alienating and all the things that they are is that they're going to say there's no evidence of that. You know, it's, it's you, I mean, the, the evidence that you'd have to show that it's not in the best interest of the child is often quite physical. Like you lived 20,000 miles from the kid's school or you travel for three weeks a month. They'll run with that. But these subtle psychological factors, which I don't even think are subtle, 
I am not seeing a judge in America account for this stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's the difficulty, right? Because it's like, it is so subtle and, and the judges are always looking for the easy way out. Yes. I mean, and so it is difficult. So what you have to do is you have to be able to present a case in such a way that they can't look away. And, mm-hmm. and, and you can't go in and say the person's a narcissist or, you know, right. accuse them of any kind of um, something like that that's not readily supportable, you know, because that's when you're, you're going to lose your own credibility, even if the person is mm-hmm. the most flaming narcissist right. in, on the planet. So you mm-hmm. have to go in with, you know, reams of supporting documentation as to what's in the best interest of the child. I mean, Tina uh, nodding her head um, because, you know, you you figured it out. And I'm really um, uh, amazed and and give you such props Mm -hmm. that you were able to go in there and think of the idea of I'm going to go watch other court proceedings and figure it out. Um, you know, so yeah. talk more about like how yeah. you were able to do that because, you know, there's so many people out there who can't afford a good lawyer, who can't afford, right. you know, a therapist. They can't afford anything. They're like, you know, you were talking about going to the food pantry or whatever. I mean, if it's like eating versus an attorney, you're going to pick eating. Right. So um, talk more about that. So, you know, I know one of the things from, I talk to parents all the time who will tell me, you know, I don't have time to go sit in the courtroom. You know, I tell them you don't have time not to. Mm -hmm. Um, I was working full time. You know, one of the things I didn't mention, I, when I left my marriage, um, you know, just so people don't go, well, you know, she has all these resources or whatnot. I left with $178 to my name, not a penny in retirement, not a penny in, you know, any type of account literally under $200. And I was working full time. I had two little girls in preschool. The cost of preschool is insane (laughs) when you've got two little ones. And, but I, I, I made that a priority and, you know, however you have to do it for me, that was the number one, you know, that was the best thing I could have ever done. It gave me so much insight into things attorneys used. And then I would go, you know what, and a lot of people so you know how did you win based on him being a narcissist I've never used that word I've written four books on the topic but I've never used that word narcissist to anybody you know I focused on his patterns of behavior that were affecting my kids exactly and you know and and paint you know seeing and and one thing I don't think people understand if I were in courtroom a I would present my case, my exact case one way, but if I were in courtroom B, just based on what I know about that judge, I would present my case completely different because they're mm-hmm. human. They bring in their own biases and yeah, they do. personal, you know, there's a judge down in Southern California who lost a child to a drug overdose. So she takes addiction issues mm-hmm. very seriously. My ex-husband was an alcoholic. So you better believe that's, I would hit heavy on the alcoholism in her courtroom. And I think people don't give that, you know, it, there's no rule book for any of this. And it's you know, so smart, so smart. So smart, so smart. Thank you. So, you know, so much of it was learning, you know, so many learning lessons. And, and when I was in the hallways of the courtroom on break, I would make conversations with every attorney that would talk to me and, you know, and so you share my story. I couldn't afford their consult, but if they're bored sitting in the hallway, I would use that as an opportunity to introduce myself, let them know. And so many were so helpful to me um, through this process, you know, just really forming those connections, knowing who every single player is in your system, every evaluator, you need a a notebook of just family court professionals. Anytime you hear something about one of them, or you witness an evaluator testifying in court, or, you know, a minor's counsel, write down every detail about them so you can make an informed decision Um, if it, you know, if you are going to be assigned an evaluator, I think one of the things I was so naive about in the beginning, I would, you know, I was desperate for someone to listen to me. And so I would show up in court and I would beg, you know, appoint minors counsel, appoint an evaluator. Somebody has got to see what's happening. And could I go, if I could go back and do it all over again, I would have said, you know, here are my three selections for an evaluator. I don't care which you, anybody can choose from this list, That's what but I, I do. would, 
Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And then it gives the other side the power and control that they need to make that decision. But like in my case, the minors counsel who was appointed because I didn't know anything about him, he turned out to be a bigger narcissist than, <laughs> oh. than my ex-husband in a lot of ways. And so it was a complete waste of time and energy and resources. And so really entrenching yourself in your system and learning the ropes and the people you have to do it. That's such great advice. Really, really great advice. I, I, you know, as you were talking, I was wondering if one of the other things that you did, because um, if you did, this would be a great idea. Um, you know, if you know that there are particularly good lawyers or lawyers who understand, you know, what you're dealing with, um, you know, pleadings are actually um, public information. Um, so did you go to the clerk and read motions and, and look at stuff that other lawyers had filed? So if I saw a case that closely represent or resembled my case, I would take down their names and go find them because in our court, you can, we're pretty archaic. We have like micro, you have to get these little slides and you oh, look okay. at all of the microfiche. And so I would go pull people's cases and just sit there and go through their whole case from. That's what I was finish. wondering. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly yeah. what I was wondering that you did. Yeah. So that's so smart. Really, really smart. But of course, very time consuming. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Dr. Romani, what would be, you know, ways that people can kind of self care and cope mm -hmm. during this process? You know, Tina, you, what, what is so striking about what you just said, and you know, just so everyone knows, I, Tina is actually literally one of my favorite people on the planet and she knows Aww. that too. So I really, you know, I mean, I, I know the, the depth of her story is that, you know, what, what's striking to anyone hearing this is that, and what I see in many of the clients I work with is that they get exhausted. They go to a place of full on helplessness hopelessness and powerlessness, which are often some of the last stops on the train before full-blown major depression and anxiety disorders and all of that, like really major psychological and psychiatric, you know, fallout from this. And as a result, the persistence you showed, Tina, is, is remarkable because, mm -hmm. and, and what I love about what you did, Tina, was you weren't trying to control things you can control, namely judges who didn't get it, custody evaluators who didn't get it, court systems who didn't get it. You weren't trying to control those mechanisms. You were trying to learn about them. And of all the guidance I've ever heard, because you feel so powerless, give yourself the time to learn. Look up the cases, learn what happened in those cases, learn about the judges. I mean, I think that, that, that well, anytime we can give a person a sense of control, that's something they can actually do, is really, really important. But I do have to say, Tina, there's a unique resilience that you're, you're manifesting, because I do think for people the day in and day out, the demoralization, and no matter how much evidence they present to the court, it feels like no matter what, it's not working out their way, to the point where I've seen children who are you know, being forced to co-reside you know, and have custody with the more narcissistic parent, to the incredible detriment of the child's mental health. And they can't, the mother can't even make the argument in this case that really it is exposure to this toxic parent. I mean, he has completely worked that whole system beautifully. So to your question though, Rebecca, number one, I would say it's absolutely critical you reach out not only for therapy with somebody who gets narcissistic abuse. And I'm really put that point on it because many, many times, I actually don't think that clients in this space should be entirely targeted as though they have post-traumatic stress disorder. I think PTSD is a very different kind of phenomenology. And while addressing early traumas and all of that may be an issue, I think that there's something rather unique about the narcissistic abuse space because it moves pretty quickly when a person gets lots of education. Because I am shocked in four to six sessions when a client really is helped to understand what happened, how their own early, you know, their family of origin issues connect, and they see it, they're like, that's it. Like, I'm good. Thank you. I'm not a crazy person. Thank you. That's not how treatment for post-traumatic stress uh, disorder that is works. so good. Yeah, it's very, very different. And now, are there many, many people out there who experience issues in their experience of a narcissistic divorce, physical violence, sexual violence, severe financial deprivation, coercive control, all things that are associated with PTSD? Absolutely. And I do think that is a subset of cases, but I think an even larger subset of cases are people who really are experiencing a more pure version 
of being absolutely confused by the manipulation. And once they simply get psychoeducation, which is how I got into putting out these YouTube videos, because not everyone could come sit in my office. There's just not even enough hours in the day for me to do that. I wrote books for this reason, thinking if people could get this, they may stop blaming themselves. So it becomes therapy with someone who gets it. Number two, is also accessing the advocacy community. That is something Tina opened me up to, is that there are people like Tina out there who get it and put resources out in a way from a lived experience perspective. Her Facebook page is a robust resource that I refer all of my clients going through this to and to her website. So those services exist. You know, Basically a support group mechanism of people who get it. But then beyond that, I really, really do tell people is that you are not defined by this experience. I actually think that survivors of narcissistic abuse who really then take this as a jumping off point to the degree we're talking about it being a trauma, what I really do see is tremendous post-traumatic growth. People saying, I can see these people coming from a mile away. I am actually going to be a lot more careful in my relationships. I am getting rid of the people in my life who are not good for me. They actually do a whole like clean out, like a toxic dump. It's, they, they, so just, they knock everyone out because they're like, I'm not doing this anymore. And they realize how many people in their midst were, their, were the enablers of the narcissistic abuse. And through a good support network, therapy, advocacy, support groups, you get people who say, it's okay. It's okay to remove people from your life because they'll get a lot of guilt. Like, how dare you not speak to this one? How dare, how dare you do you? Do you. And so it's very much a, it's a process of healing, which I've got to tell you, I have seen many, many people soar. They go back to school. They take on the careers they thought they wouldn't. They travel. They are very, they feel like better parents. I mean, they really do come out of it. But all of that said, it really is a daily practice. Things like mindfulness, meditation, um, getting, getting also treatment for other disorders that may have come up or gotten exacerbated, anxiety disorders, depression substance use disorders that sometimes flare up in the face of all of this. It's about taking care of you. And also keep in mind, Rebecca and Tina, you know this very well, is that people who've been through a narcissistic divorce or a long period of, of narcissistic abuse in their lives, self-care for themselves is the first thing they threw out. They stop taking care of themselves. They'll often start eating more poorly, gaining weight, making themselves at risk for things like diabetes. They don't get their regular health care appointments. They don't take care of themselves because in some ways, staying in a narcissistically abusive relationship is so sort of self-harming that you're like, why would I take care of myself? You know, it's like you're a car, you just drive into the ground at that point. And that awakening of getting out of that relationship is often an awakening that you're this beautiful soul, this beautiful creature that deserves to be taken care of. So it's lots of enlightenment, lots of awakening, lots of education, lots of support, lots of therapy. And then, and again, slowly but surely getting going into a wiser future. Yeah. And that's such great stuff. Really, really good advice. And, um, you know, I would want to, I just want to add in as far as like the, um, the legal perspective on this, something that people can do is, um, you know, maybe if you can't afford to have a lawyer for the entire process, but maybe have a consulting lawyer, you know, maybe somebody that you'd be willing to, you know, if you have a little bit of money, you could go in and just make sure that, you know, kind of like what Tina did when she was sort of having these hallway conversations, <laughs> but, you know, if you mm -hmm. wanted to have somebody who was, um, you know, taking a look at a, an agreement and maybe just reviewing an agreement for you and just spending an hour of their time doing that, you know, something, you know, where you get a little bit of that legal protect, protect, protection if you can afford to, to have even that. Um, and, um, you know, obviously I have a program for that as well for people. And, you know, but if, there, if there's a way that you can access some help, um, that's, that's, I think, really, really helpful. Um, for people to, to have access to that. So um, I think that, um, you know, so from, from your perspective as handling the case, uh, Tina, is there anything else that you wanted to add as far as like, you know, advice or, or things that people can do to um, manage this if they, if they want to divorce a narcissist without a lawyer? Yeah, you know, and I wanted to first real quick piggyback on something Dr. Romani said about my resilience. Um, you know, I, I want to say for anybody who's kind of questioning their own resilience, there were definitely times where I crumbled. You know, if you, I pride myself on my documentation and how I went about presenting my case. But if you look at my documentation, there could be a six month chunk of time where I didn't document anything. And that's not because 
there weren't things going on. It was literally because I had to press pause and put on my own oxygen mask and, you know, just take a break from it. Oh, because I love the way you put that. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. You know, the, this is daunting. I don't care how, you know, strong a person is. And I've been fetal position in the backseat of my car after court. And, and so, you know, I'm human and, and, it, you know, it's, it's a difficult battle, but I did prevail. And um, just, if I can add in, in November, we terminated his parental rights, which I was told can never be done in, or it's really, really challenging to do it in is California. Very difficult. It's difficult anywhere. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, one, one of the things going back to the beginning that I used, I knew money was his biggest button and I, the kids were mine. And so I let his child support balance just keep growing and growing. And so by last year, it was a hundred thousand dollars. It finally started affecting him, his passport, his driver's license. And so I finally had that leverage, leverage <laughs> to go, hey, let's you go your way, I go mine. I forgive the hundred thousand, I get the girls and they're gonna live happily ever after. And so, you know, you just never know what's around the next corner. And I want people to know that I see the most dire circumstances turn completely around. I see parents who have lost their kids completely, get them back. You just, you know, and that's why you keep going and you keep putting one yes. foot in front of the other. And that is a really good point, actually. Um, I have seen cases many times where, you know, the narcissist will get the edge early on, you know, and, and so it just seems like the case is going their way, going their way, going their way. The judge just loves them. They're buying into everything. And you can turn it around. I've turned it around. You know, eventually, if you pull together the right documentation, and I cannot stress enough, I know Dr. Raman, I, Dr. Ramani and I both have said many times, please document everything. And, you know, I talked to somebody just this morning and she was like, I, I just, I feel like I'm writing this stuff down. It's never going to matter. Who cares? I'm like, no, it does matter. It will matter. Um, no. And, and, and if I can just interject, you know, I say 99% of my documentation has never been seen by anyone. And it was that 1% that that protected my kids. Yep. So, well, yeah. and, and I said to her, you know, this morning I said, you know, you just don't know what that summary is going to be. That's going to be the one that changes the judge's mind. You know, it might be summary of their lies and, you know, and then you have text message from uh, August 19th and text message from July 31st that, you know, they conflict with each other or, you know, and, and that's part, number one on your summary and number two on your summary is these two text messages or whatever. I mean, you just don't know until you're looking at the entire picture of it, what, you're going to be able to piece together to go, oh, this will be a good summary. Like, how about this that says, you know, um, how many times the person has changed or didn't show up for their parenting time? Or maybe it's, um, you know, something else that they did or, you know, times that they gave up their parenting time to be with their new significant other. Um, you know, you just, you don't know until you are able to look at the full mass of all of the documentation. And yeah, so some of it might not end up being used, but some of it, a lot of it might be. And I've won entire cases on that. And that's how you shift the judge's perspective a lot of times. And that becomes and your leverage. And I do, um, once a month, I offer a documentation webinar where I share my entire system that I use to protect my kids. Ooh, so, that's good. Yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah. 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 We'll have to make sure that we put a link to that um, in, in um, our show notes, our, our respective show notes so that people can find that. Um, so, um, well, this I think has been fantastic. Dr. Romani, is there anything else that you wanted to add on this? No, I'm, I mean, I think it's just, I, I'm so honored to be both with you, Rebecca, and work closely with you, Rebecca, and, and you know, to, to have been working closely with Tina. I think that I know more than anything, knowledge and information is so much power here. And yes, to acknowledge not everyone can afford an attorney, but to at least have these, to keep learning about these, these things you can do and getting the resources, I think it's huge. Like the main way we're gonna dismantle 
this global scourge of narcissistic abuse. And it's not just in our divorces. That's what we're talking about today or in relationships. Oh, it's, it's, in the, other, it's, it's the other places. global pl- pandemic. It's everywhere. It is yeah. the other global pandemic, honestly. Yeah. And so it's all over the place. And I think that the more we can create information about this, the more people can protect themselves. This is real. And to everyone out there who has spent years, de- maybe I'm the crazy one. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Absolutely not. My entire life is devoted to helping people stop gaslighting themselves and to start putting the responsibility on these broken systems and people, frankly, out there who are contributing to that sense. So I'm, I'm again, I'm honored to work with both of you, and I'm hoping that this kind of information really helps people set for, set themselves free and grow into the full, amazing human beings that they have the potential to be. Uh, well, the feeling is completely mutual, a hundred percent, and. Um, um, Tina, I want to give you the chance to have the last word if you mm-hmm. want to, ha- to have it since, um, you know, you're, you won the battle. You did it. I did. I did. And, you know, I'm breaking the cycle. I came from a, a dysfunctional upbringing and it has been my goal since the day I had children and, and recognized that there were problems that it ends with me. And, you know, my girl's are teenagers now and they can go into a coffee shop and say, mom, that guy's a narcissist (laughs) or, you know, or on social media, they recognize who the selfie people are. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's hope for our next generation because of people like Dr. Romani who are out there and, and shedding light on this very, very dark topic. And you, Rebecca, and I'm just so honored to be a part of this collaboration because I think it will help so many. Thank you. And thank you both. This is fantastic. Thanks for joining me on this part two of my two-part episode, an incredible conversation with Tina Swithin and Dr. Romani. I'm so thrilled that we're able to bring you this kind of content and these kinds of experts to help you navigate and negotiate any kind of things with the heinous personality also called a narcissist. Make sure you subscribe to my channel, hit that notification bell. And if you like this video, give it a like, give it a share, drop me a comment. Let me know that you were here. If you'd like, you can join my Facebook group. It's totally free and it's totally private so that you connect, you can connect with others and get more support. I'll drop a link to that below, as well as a link to my free Crush My Negotiation prep worksheet. Um, you can grab that if you are getting ready to negotiate with a narcissist. I'm, so, I'm Rebecca Zong. I'm so glad that you were here today and that you stopped by my channel. Um, and today is a great day to start negotiating your best life. I'll see you in the next video.